joining me now on the Knicks Film School podcast, um, a living legend. Uh, I sung his praises a lot the last time he was on the pod, but I just can't get enough of it because he has earned the designation a member of the Knicks beat since uh, 1954. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Willie Knowles. Did you say, I, I think, well, do you remember Willie Knowles? I don't think so. Um, I don't remember Willie Knowles. He, he came up, I have a, tri- a Knicks trivia calendar. He, he came up on it the other day for some reason. I Maybe like the first Nick to do something. In any case, um, been killing it all year, just like he does uh, every year. Um, the, uh, the one and only Mark Berman of the New York Post. Hello, Mark. Hey, Jonathan. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the kind words. But yeah, it was actually 1999-2000, the year after the championship. and uh, Not the championship, but the the NBA Finals. It felt like a championship to... Yeah, it did, right. It did. Compared to now. But uh, yeah, so since then, uh, the Knicks have not been back, obviously. (laughs) Not so so much. Um, You have not gone anywhere, though. Um, and I actually, before we talk about the team, uh, just briefly want to talk about it this year, because I, I actually wasn't 100 percent sure until we spoke beforehand, if you had been going to games. Um, what has uh, it been like? Because uh, you've been going in person. You even, like you said, made a road trip to Washington. What has it been like covering the team in this uh, you know crazy year? Yeah, it's been very difficult. I've gone to all the home games, but two. Uh, my backup, Peter Body, went to the uh, to two of the games. I've been at the Garden. Uh, for the others. And it was very depressing before they let fans in. Uh, The fake noise actually got annoying. It was actually more depressing with the fake noise because Mm. it just didn't seem real. I mean, it, we felt we were on a sound stage and they're putting the media up on the chase bridge pretty far away for safety reasons. I guess we have to show up four hours before the game to get tested at the garden theater. Uh, you know, so does Walt Frazier and Mike Breen and Rebecca Harlow. So we're all in this theater getting tested, waiting for our results for an hour. It's quite a long day. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have to be there, I feel, to see the bench. And, you know, one of the advantages, I can see where the executives are sitting, you know, Dolan and, every, and everything uh, where he's sitting. He doesn't sit by the baseline anymore. But since the fans were let in a couple of weeks ago, it's been amazing. I, I I was concerned that 2,000 fans would not make enough noise and it would be <laughs> even more depressing. Just the opposite. The fans have been amazing. They come to the garden and it's like a party. It's like the pandemic, all the frustrations of the pandemic, they just let loose for two and a half hours, chanting, especially for Julius Randle. I mean, that's <laughs> a lot of noise. And, you know, I think they're going to, you know, extend the... Uh, the number of people uh, at some point before the regular season finale. And really even louder. I think so. I, I think we're headed in that direction. Uh, I know the garden would love to see more than 2000 uh, by uh, the, the regular season finale in May. Um, I think that's one of the things to watch. I mean, God, I'm not going to allow myself to dream quite yet, but like, you know, playoff game in the garden with, let's say it's 4,000 or 5,000, you know, it's going to sound like reasonable estimate. I think. Yeah, no, I think so too. Um, you just brought up a, a bunch of stuff that I want to touch on. Um, let's start here. Uh, you have been doing this since 1999, as you just uh, stated, and you have seen a lot of bad basketball. You've seen a lot of, um, you know, it's the most polite way to put this, a lot of dispiriting, um, you know, whatever you call it. Like the, 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 the aura around the team has often been not what you want. Yeah. This season, it feels like, I don't know if you want to say they've turned a corner, they've, you know, taken a page from the 90s, whatever you want to say. Um, you, I mean, Tibbs was here when you started covering the team. Right. And, he and he went away for a long time and now he's back. Can you, where would you, I don't want to say rank this season, but like, does it feel real to you? What we all want, what all fans want to believe, like, this is real, they're back. Like, does it feel that way to you in terms of just the, the aura around the team? I think they are for real in terms of a playoff team, but it's such a bizarre season. I don't know if you want to put an asterisk on it, but I think a coach like Tom Thibodeau thrives even more in this setting because the games keep coming at you and he's so well prepared. He's so experienced. He's 63 years old. He doesn't look it, but he's been around this game forever. And I think for some of the younger coaches, 
who don't have that experience, the the schedule is a bear. And he, he, it was a short training camp. There was no exhibition season. Well, there was a shortened preseason. Yeah. So Thibodeau's preparation is more valuable than ever. Some teams aren't holding shoot arounds. Thibodeau always either has a shoot around or a walkthrough. Randall keeps talking about the same uh, thing regarding Thibodeau. He prepares every game like it's a playoff game. And it really helps in this situation. And they've got him pretty lucky with the COVID-19. <laughs> Derek Rose missed the last two games. Frank Nilakina was not in the rotation at the time. And he missed, you know, about eight, nine days in uh, quarantine. But as far as health, I think compared to other teams, they've been healthy. And that's huge. That's such an underrated factor. But Thibodeau, I think he's very adaptable. And I think this environment has really made Thibodeau even more uh, valuable. And so we'll see, like, it's a little bit of an asterisk season. So we'll see what happens next season when, you know, the reporters might be in the locker room and there's more distractions. And yeah. like, I think the Knicks love the fact that we're not around <laughs> present. We're not in the locker room before the game. We're not in the locker room after the game. And they always talk about how close knit this group is. And I think they have more time together. When we're in the locker room before the game, we may see two players because they don't want to be there when we're there sometimes. It was like Mitch was usually there. I mean, I'm not there yeah. as much as you, but like Mitch was there last year. I'm trying to think who – like Dennis Smith Jr. would be playing around on his phone, <laughs> um, making fun of you yeah. um, occasionally. Alfred would come in once in a while. It, it, a couple of guys. They would come in and out. we try to get them for a few minutes. But now they're – before a game, they're all in the locker room together and there's no distractions or – interruptions you yeah. know write about that stuff but i mean i think that's a little factor too i once asked randall uh you know do you miss the media now in the locker room and he gave a a polite answer hey mark we miss you guys you know you guys are part of this and you know hopefully yeah. you guys will be back to be honest i wonder if the nba allows us back in europe oh. uh, reporters are not allowed in the locker room uh, they have a mixed zone uh, for for basketball and soccer, United States is where reporters are allowed in the locker room. That's sort of a United States thing. We'll see how the NBA handles it. Yeah, that's hmm. that's interesting because, like you know, I, I you're a veteran of this is more than anyone. When you're in, maybe not before the games, but after the games, at least again, me having never done this before, walking in, kind of just feeling out the room, you you learn stuff. You know, that you can't learn if a player, if they pull a player out and they put a player in front of a microphone and say, here, and it's, it's not, it's not the same, but does the NBA care enough about that to make a rule change for next year? I don't, yeah. I don't know what the answer is. Well, you say you learn stuff. For instance, Julius Randle, after a game, we get in the locker room, what, 15 to 20 minutes after a game, yeah. we all dressed at his locker, ready to talk yeah. and ready to get the heck out of there. <laughs> He was yeah. literally the first one to leave. It was a tough season for him. He he didn't feel good about himself. And as a result, he wasn't the leader. I and mean, he's admitted it in all these national things. He wrote it. He wrote it a, a week ago that I wasn't the leader I needed to be. Yeah. And, and I knew that by the fact that he was out of that locker room so quickly after a game. He was by his locker. We Sometimes we would, MSG Network would start the interview before we were able to get inside the yeah. locker room because it's a long walk from the holding pen uh, in the bowels of the garden. But now, you know, Randall is the leader of the team and I wish that Thibodeau would name him Captain Randall, but that's not what he does. He doesn't bestow, t uh, give titles like that. He wants to be you know, the head coach and the ultimate leader. Um, he does seem to like to be the guy. Uh, you wrote it a few days ago. You know, we'll see if, like, he, look, he, he presses his guys hard. Randall said, I don't know if you asked the question yesterday. Uh, we're recording this on Monday after the All-Star game. Uh, somebody asked him about his only playing 13 minutes, and he's like, I'm fine with it. Um, I... I get the sense that they're going to be fine this season under Tibbs. I think the Tibbs effect maybe two, three years down the line, you know, but I wonder if, if they're set, if they're putting the pieces in place now, and then we could start to maybe transition the conversation towards what's next. Um, I almost wonder, does this front office mind that Tibbs is driving these guys right now? Because isn't the, it, 
here's what my thinking has always been this year. The toughest part is getting the ship right. Once you got the ship right, you could figure it out from there. But do you know what I'm saying? What do you what do you think about that? I think Leon Rose knew exactly what he was getting in Thibodeau, and he thought he was the right guy at the right time. Uh, some people, some critics of the move said, you know, Thibodeau, maybe for a rebuilding team, it's not a right fit. But Leon didn't want to be a quote-unquote rebuilding team. Leon wanted to compete for the playoffs. He knows culture and the image of the franchise is key in drawing yeah. free agents or having – players list the Knicks on their trade wish list. Yeah. So he really wanted, especially with the 10 team format, he really wanted to be in the playoffs this season. And by the way, technically, if you don't win the play in round, you're not, you haven't broken the playoff drought. I've spoken to the league about it. Oh. So yeah, if you finish in 10th place and lose in the play in, you're in the lottery. And I was about to say, but you also go in the lottery, which is like, I almost, not, Right. The, the Knicks technically would not have made the playoffs yeah. for uh, then eight straight seasons. Uh, but yet, yeah, so Thibodeau set the culture and we, will he wear out the players this season? As you pointed out, probably not. It's a very good group. But, you know, next season, Randall comes back. I mean, he's leading the league in minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you wonder if, uh, you know, after a while, Tibbs can wear on you. And Derek Rose, the critics of Thibodeau say that Thibodeau played Rose so hard that he had those leg and knee uh, injuries. I mean, I think it's a little, yeah. out, but we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I think those are, those are good questions for probably after the year. Um, you mentioned the front uh, being in the garden is a nice thing to be able to see where guys sit, where the front office is. You snuck something into a column, I think it was last week, about how Scott Perry has not was not around for a bit. I, I didn't imagine that, right? Uh, that he was uh, down in the G League bubble, I think? Yeah, he's missed the last five home games. And part of it is protocols, but he's been in the scout in the G League. W William Wesley hasn't missed a game. And Leon missed the last game. He wasn't in his seat. But I think that was just, you know, that I don't think that was related to any weird thing. But the fact that Scott Perry is not at the games, the last five games, he was, he's been at every game in prior seasons on the road, maybe so, this one game for a scouting mission yeah. in college, but it, it was definitely notable that Scott missed five straight home games. All right. So let's see if I can't get us both in a little bit of trouble. Um, there were some articles that came out uh, a week or two ago. I think Bondi had one. I know Ian had one. I think there might be one more that I'm forgetting, which was basically the tenor of them was, Hey, let's appreciate Scott Perry for what he did. Yeah. Um, I one too. You, yeah. Okay. So there we go. How do I put this delicately? Um, it felt for me reading this like, boy, this is a nice little press tour for a guy who maybe might be looking for a general manager position with another team next year. Um, because the Knicks, Leon Rose, have brought in all these other people and didn't want to put Scott Perry out by the by the pasture yet because he needed him. He was the he was the carryover guy. Am I reading way too much into that? Or what do you what do you think about Mr. Perry's future with the team? Listen, he's on the final year of his contract. Uh, William Wesley is really what Scott Perry was, the this the side man to the president. Steve, you know, he was the sidekick to Steve Mills. And now uh, William Wesley is the sidekick to Leon Rose. And, and William Wesley, you know, you talk to people around the league, Leon thinks the world of World Wide West, no pun intended. And if William r wants to do something, Leon usually, you know, especially if he, you know, forces the issue, Leon is going to go along with it. So, yeah, Scott is no longer a top decision maker. He's more of a glorified scout. His future with the team, right, is definitely up in the air. I mean, there's no contract extension uh, being talked about right now. Uh, he was in the G League bubble for a long time. I mean, it's not the, you know, listen, it's very difficult to scout colleges now anyway. Yeah. Uh, you can't even go to college uh, practices, the scouts. Uh, but yeah, I think... Uh, the front office in general, I mean, the, 
there's no clear vision from the front office right now. Like Leon Rose hasn't talked to us for almost eight months now. And we'd like to see that. And maybe those articles stem from, we're not sure what Leon's thinking all the time. Uh, and Scott Perry signed Randall and most of these players. Uh, they're winning with Scott Perry and Steve Mills's players. And that was the basis of my story and probably the other guys. Well, it's right. It's correct. They are winning with those guys. It's not, you know. Right. The only thing Scott and S- Steve Mills didn't do, and I wrote this, and what Phil Jackson couldn't do, they didn't hire the right coach. Yeah. And on the year anniversary of Leon Rose, I said, that's the best thing he's done. He's hired Tom Thibodeau. But in terms of personnel, he hasn't made a big move. He got Derrick Rose because Thibodeau begged him to get, you know, uh, Derrick Rose. That wasn't a Leon Rose, like, we need Derrick Rose. Uh, Tom loves Derrick and just feels more comfortable when Derrick is on his club. So, and the same with Taj Gibson, I'm told. So those sure. additions were really Tom's. I don't know about the free agent signings. You know, the Austin Rivers thing is so bizarre now. I know Tom wanted Austin Rivers. And now, You've been all over this Austin Rivers oh thing. Oh, my God, it's so bizarre. <laughs> uh, listen, obviously, Austin hasn't handled it as great as he could. But, oh. uh, but yeah, so uh, back to the question. Yeah, Scott is no longer in the same. He's got the GM title, but yeah. doesn't have the same clout. Um, people will kill me if before you get out of here, I don't ask you about some trade stuff. Um I've I've heard again. I don't have, you hear a hell of a lot more than me. Um, I've heard that they're still looking to actively upgrade um, either of the guard spots. I think probably point guard primarily, and then you know the two right now. Reggie Bullock starting. Um, I get the sense that they are still not in the mindset of we're like all in for this year because that would be silly. They're not they're not in that state yet. But I think they are going to approach this like look if we can make the team considerably better um, without sacrificing anything that we really care about long-term, we're going to do it. And then I think the question becomes like, well, what, what do you characterize as something they care about long-term and what do you characterize as something they don't really care about long-time? Does, does Knox fit into that category? Does Frank fit into that category? Like the 23 Dallas pick, whatever. Um, Where do you, you know, we have, uh, what is it? March 8th. Uh, so we have about two weeks, two and a half weeks to go before the trade deadline. Um, what do you predict? What do you think is going to happen between now and March 25th? I think a lot has to do with how they play coming out of the All-Star break also. Uh, I think Leon realizes that there's this great chemistry, great camaraderie, a close-knit unit. He doesn't want to do anything that's going to disrupt that. But you're right. They, they, they know they need a talent upgrade, particularly in the backcourt. Uh, they as much as Emmanuel quickly has, you know, titillated the fans, they realize he's not like a real true starting point guard. Not he yet, at least. Yeah. He doesn't have the playmaking skills. He's not an organizer. He, he could be a great sixth man or, mm-hmm. you know, playing as a starter, but needs another playmaker with him. Uh, and so he'd be like sort of more in an off guard role, like when he's playing with Derek Rose off the bench. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, they're always out looking for a true point guard as well. Uh, listen, Scott Perry thinks the world of Oladipo. I was a, I was about yeah. to bring him up. The scouts I talked to say he doesn't look like the same player. He's not the same player. The numbers say he's not the same but player. He's, physically, you know. they could see it's 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 not about even the the percentages and the point production. They just look at it and and see that he could be physically struggling, but the guy's still averaging 20 points a game and the nights they lose some nights, they're so horrific offensively. I mean, they've had some nights where they've shot the ball well from the three point range, but you know, they could use, and listen, their three point percentages has, has risen, uh, yes, but they've good. been playing some really lousy teams entering the all-star break. Uh, but yeah, the, the, they're looking to see what's around maybe at the buyout market. We'll see if Drummond gets bought out, how much they, attack that situation robinson is going to get reevaluated any day so he could be back soon Taj yeah. had a pretty severe ankle injury sprained ankle yeah we haven't heard much on that i'm assuming he's going to be out for a little while i mean it's probably a, he the knicks get lucky by the all-star break you know having him get to heal but they were really they had no centers other than new mm-hmm. noel who also has knee 
issues. Yeah. So we don't want to play him 38 minutes a night, but which, which they've been doing. Right. right. So, but they're coming close to maybe getting healthy. So maybe the drum and even as a rental uh, doesn't make so much sense because they're worried again about chemistry and does he fit with Randall? Uh, but yeah, I think they're going to make a move at the deadline. I, I don't think it's going to be a gigantic move. I think they're pretty happy. I think they're playing with house money right now. They don't want to do anything that could be a little risky. They want a low risk move that could upgrade the talent level. I think that's, uh, that's well said. Uh, last thing before I get you out of here, prediction. Um, give me where you think they, where you think they finish. What, what seed do you think the Knicks finish in? Listen, they have a tough start, obviously yeah. with the four game road trip and it's Milwaukee and it's Philly and it's Brooklyn. And maybe they still won in Oklahoma city. Uh, but there's so much confidence right now. And Thibodeau did say it's a good time for the break, but I thought they were really rolling and we'll see how they come back. And do they still have that same momentum? Thibodeau's such a great coach. I think, I don't think they're going to finish fifth, uh, but I think they'll, the key, the, one of the reasons the NBA loves this format is the race for the sixth seed. Yeah. It's the big race yeah. to avoid the play in. So uh, I don't think they're going to get top six. I think they're going to be seven, be in the playoff uh, play in where they have the edge versus the 10th place team. Uh, they have to stay healthy. Derek has to stay healthy. Randall is just an iron man. And I believe he's a durable player. He, mm -hmm. he didn't miss a game last year, except when his grandmother died and he only missed two games and he came back to the team and he was very close to his grandmother. Yeah. So uh, I think it's a seventh place team as long as there's no big injury. Uh, and that's a credit to Tom Thibodeau, who I've already written should win coach of the year because of the dramatic change he made with this franchise. Utah has been rolling for years as a solid playoff team. Obviously, they've stepped it up this season, but I just feel this is the year to give it to someone who's made the most change to a franchise, not a – I mean, it's been a leap for Utah – but not as dramatic. Same with the Sixers. It's harder to go from where the Knicks were to where the Knicks are than to go from where Utah was to where Utah is, in, in my opinion. Yeah, and Quinn Snyder is a terrific coach. He's fantastic. Oh, he's great. He's great. And Dapper is a great coach. Is darn good too. And he's done. He's got so much talent, though. I think that shows that Brett Brown sort of underachieved, and it also says a little <laughs> about David Fisdale. Shots Tom, fired. <laughs> yeah. Well, with Tom Thibodeau's performance with these players, I mean. When you're David Fisdale, you're like, wow, this doesn't make me look that great. But, you know, listen, Fisdale yeah. knows that Thibodeau is one of the elite coaches in the game. Yeah. Um, Mark, stick around one sec, uh, but I am going to bid adieu to our uh, listeners. Thank you very much for joining us on another episode of the Next Film School Podcast. Don't forget, if you are not reading Mark, I still read Mark Berman every day. I write a damn newsletter and I still read Mark Berman every day because he's, he's that good. Um, I was about to say, tell the folks at home where they could find you. But if you don't know where Mark Berman is, um, what, what's your Twitter? Is it just it's Berman? I should I should know. Yes, this. NY Post. NY Post Berman. Long Dash Berman, something like that. Why are you not verified, by the way? You know, I've been trying to get the office to uh, get that done. They said Twitter is not verifying right now the last several months when when readers pointed it out to me i was like oh let me get this verified and then the boss has said that twitter is on hold oh come on with the, with the blue check ridiculousness um all right well anyway thanks everybody for listening to uh mr berman and myself we'll be back with another episode very soon <laughs>